Well, uh, first of all, uh, thanks for coming. Last year, I was here talking about uh, how to use actor critic reinforcement learning algorithms to make malware undetectable against antivirus software. And this year, I have been lucky enough to be a speaker again, so thank you. Well, I'm going to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Ruben Martinez, and I've worked as a security pen tester, as an ethical hacker, for more than uh, 10 years. But I've been interested in artificial intelligence since I was at uh, Polytechnic University. And I'm currently working at uh, DataHack, uh, specifically in the area of labs, uh, developing a research project called uh, Diaphora. And what are we doing in this project in Diaphora? Well, we have to give intelligence to a humanoid robot. It's a pepper robot. You may have seen it in the DataHack booth. Uh, or in TV, or in MasterChef, maybe. <laughs> so uh, it can assist people with Alzheimer's disease. And some of the skills that a robot must have uh, are autonomous navigation, uh, speech to text, uh, text to speech, uh, emotions detection, combining sources of voice tone, uh, message meaning, and microfacial expressions, and uh, facial recognition capabilities. And this last feature, the facial recognition uh, capability, is what has motivated this talk. And our robot uh, must be able to recognize a known patient and must have a quick method to learn the identity of a new patient using only one picture of that new patient. This is a very important point, okay? And uh, let's start, okay? It's time to see the menu for this talk. Well, uh, let's start by talking about how we have faced the problem of uh, recognizing faces. Uh, next, we are going to see how convolutional neural network works. Uh, these algorithms uh, will be the bricks to achieve our goal of identifying faces. And in this point, uh, we are going to see a very important thing. Uh, some pitfalls of uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, well, uh, CNNs uh, have become in the standard way to develop uh, artificial vision projects. Um, because of that, it's good to know what uh, limitations we are going to, fi to find if we work with this kind of algorithms, okay? And in the third point, uh, we are going to see how to make a more robust and generalizable convolutional neural networks. And one of the hardening techniques that we have used to reach that goal uh, it's known as a spatial transformer networks. And uh, once we have seen uh, all the basic tools with which you are going to work, uh, I'm going to present what kind of uh, neural network architecture we have used to develop this facial recognition model, and what kind of loss function we have tried to minimize to carry out the training of this uh, model. And uh, once we have seen all this theory, I'm going to show you a video of the robot using this facial recognition pipeline. And in this video, the robot uh, will have to recognize a person from whom the robot will only have one picture of his face in its uh, knowledge base. Mm, but uh, that person won't have appeared in the training set of the facial recognition model. Okay, this is the key. And you could ask, uh, what is that uh, facial, or this, this uh, knowledge base of the robot? Well, uh, it's only a folder in which we are going to place one picture of the face of each person that the robot will have to recognize. And we're going to label each image with the name of the owner of that face. And I would like to finish the talk by showing a new path that we're going to explore, a spiking neural networks. Is there anyone who has ever heard about spiking neural networks? No? Yes, one, two, <laughs> three, okay, that's right. I'm going to start in, I'm going to, to be in your first time. <laughs> it's a, a good point. Well, uh, this new path is where we believe that uh, artificial intelligence will advance if we really want to achieve what is known as artificial general intelligence or a strong AI. Well, uh, what we are doing now using deep learning models uh, are uh, known as uh, weak AI. We only can solve very, very small problems in a very limited environment. But uh, spiky neural networks are more inspired by biological models based on neuroscience than deep learning models. Well, so uh, let's start. 
Well, um, how have we faced the problem of uh, recognizing a person's identity? Well, uh, we have followed that uh, pipeline. The robot will uh, capture using its frontal camera, an Asus Xeon Pro with captures depth, uh, an image of the scene in front of it. And we are going to use a machine learning model to detect its face present in that image. And now we are going to make a crop of this area, and we are going to pass this area to the convolutional uh, facial recognition model, which will be in charge of uh, assigning a numerical representation to that face. And this numerical representation will be known as embedding. Well, next, uh, our model will have to compute the distance between the embedding of that face and the embedding of each face present in the knowledge base of the robot. And once we have done that, the network will have to determine which embedding of the knowledge base of the robot is the closest to the embedding of the face captured by the uh, camera of the robot. And if that distance is less than a certain threshold, then the model will return the identity associated with the embedding of the knowledge base that is the closest to the embedding of the face captured by the camera of the robot. Blah, blah, blah. And otherwise, the model uh, will return the value of unknown identity. Okay, this is the, the pipeline. And uh, to... In this point, uh, I would like to, to talk about uh, one thing. Uh, all of this uh, that uh, we are doing here is uh, to ensure that um, uh, the, the thing that uh, uh, we have uh, to use uh, a lot of uh, methods to make a more robust convolutional neural network, such as uh, data augmentation techniques, or uh, uh, for example, uh, transfer learning, which is a must if you work uh, with uh, convolutional neural networks, or the spatial transformer networks, or modification in the convolutional operator uh, to add it more transformation op uh, operations. Uh, all of this is uh, to ensure that the data distribution of the training set or the facial recognition model is as similar as possible than the data distribution that the model will find in uh, real environments when it has to, to make predictions. And you could think that uh, this kind of algorithms uh, have a poor generalization capacity. And you will be right. Um, because of that, we still need big data, okay? If you want to work with supervised learning issuing convolutional neural networks. Well, and uh, to develop the detection of each face present in an image, uh, we didn't want to train a deep learning model. But uh, we decided to use a supervised machine learning algorithm that is quite robust in this task, and its name is uh, Hard Cascades. Uh, well, uh, this model uh, receives an image, and for each face present in that, in that image, it will return the coordinates of the bounding box that surrounds each face. Uh, I'm not going to explain these algorithms because the time of the talk is limited, and I prefer to delve into the part of the pipeline in which we have used uh, deep learning models. Uh, so, as I said before, uh, next uh, we are going to make a crop of the area of the bounding box that surrounds its face, and we are going to pass this area to the facial recognition model. And this facial recognition model is based uh, on uh, convolutional neural networks. So let's see a brief introduction. Well, uh, convolutional neural networks uh, combines different types of layers, and among them we can find, for example, the convolutional layer and the pooling layer. So how does the convolutional layer work? Uh, well, uh, first of all, we are going to see how to represent an image. We are going to use a matrix of H pixel of height and W pixel of width and C channel colors. Um, for example, a uh, grayscale image will only have uh, one color channel and a uh, color image will be represented using uh, red, green, and blue color channels. And in the uh, convolutional layer, we are going to slide this uh, orange matrix over our original image, the green matrix, by one pixel. And uh, this value is managed uh, using a hyperparameter called Stride. Okay? And for its position, we are going to compute the element-wise multiplication between the two matrices, 
and uh, we are going to add the multiplication outputs to uh, get the final, uh, the, the interior, that interior, which will be a single element in the output matrix. Okay? And in that terminology, the orange matrix is known as a filter or kernel or feature detector, and the output matrix, matrix uh, is known as a convolved feature or feature map or activation map. Okay? And in practice, uh, a convolutional uh, neural network uh, learns the values of these filters during its training process using backpropagation. And uh, the, the point is that we still need to provide uh, some hyperparameters before of the training process. <laughs> hyperparameters like, for example, uh, the number of filters, the filter size, the stride, the padding, which consists of uh, filling the edges of an image with zeros. And here, uh, you can see the equation uh, to compute the feature map size using the values of that uh, hyperparameters. And summarizing, uh, the more filters you have, the more image features get extracted, and the better your convolutional neural networks uh, become at recognizing patterns in unseen images. Well, now uh, in this picture, we can see uh, an image of our entire convolutional neural networks, which is a hierarchical learning. I mean, the, fir the filters of the first layers uh, are going to detect patterns, or simple patterns like uh, lines, borders, corners, and something like that. And the filters of the final layers uh, are going to detect complex patterns based on the knowledge of the previous layers. Okay, this is the key point of this slide. Well, uh, now it's time to talk about the pooling layer. Well, uh, the pooling layer reduces the dimensionality of each feature, of each feature map, uh, but retains the most important information. It's like a generaliz generalization technique that uh, has uh, a convolutional neural network. Um, uh, we can find uh, different types of uh, uh, spatial poolings. Uh, for example, uh, max pooling, average pooling, zoom pooling. And in case of uh, uh, max pooling, uh, we are going to define a spatial neighborhood, uh, for example, a two times two window, and we are going to take the largest value of the feature map within that window. Or instead of uh, taking the largest value, we could have taken the, um, for example, the sum or the average of all elements within that window. And we'll have used it, uh, in these cases, uh, the average pooling or the sum pooling. Uh, next, uh, we are going to a slide or two times two uh, window, and we are going to take the maximum value uh, for each region. Okay? And in this point, I'm going to introduce the concept of a receptive field, which is present also in uh, neuroscience, in our visual cortex. Okay? Uh, what is the uh, receptive field of a neuron? Well, it's only the region of uh, the stimulus space that uh, causes the firing activation of that neuron. And uh, here, uh, you can see the equation to compute the uh, size of the receptive field in layer K, assuming that uh, the size of the receptive field in the first layer is 1. But uh, coming back to the uh, topic of the pooling layer, uh, there are a few downsides which make it an uh, undesirable operator, we can say that. Uh, for example, uh, the pooling layer is destructive. It discards a lot of uh, feature activations, and because of that, we are going to lose exact positional information. And the point is, uh, the, ex uh, the uh, positional information is invaluable when we are working with uh, visual recognition tasks. And another limitation of the pooling layer is that uh, with a small receptive field, uh, the effects of the pooling operator uh, will be felt uh, only towards deeper layers of the network, where the size of the feature maps will be usually small. And uh, because of that, uh, intermediate layers may suffer from large input uh, distortions. And we cannot uh, increase the size of the receptive fields arbitrarily because uh, uh, it will downsample our feature maps too aggressively, 
and we will lose a lot of uh, positional information. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, here is where um, spatial transformers networks come into play. Okay, to make a more robust uh, uh, and generally disabled convolutional neural networks. Okay. Well, spatial uh, transformer networks are uh, a, a differentiable module uh, that learns how to apply uh, different types of affine transformation to the feature map where they are inserted. Okay, and all this to ensure or to remove, in this case, uh, spatial variance. This is the key point of this, of this technique. Well, uh, we could define uh, a spatial transformer network uh, uh, using uh, its uh, three characteristics. Uh, for example, a spatial transformer network is modular. I mean, uh, it could be inserted anywhere in your network with a relatively a small tweaking. And also, a spatial transformer network uh, is uh, dynamic. I mean, uh, a spatial transformer network uh, applies a different transformation on the feature map where it is injected in for its input example, as compared to the pooling layer that acts identically for all the input examples. Okay? And another characteristic and a very important point is that a spatial transformer network is uh, differentiable. And because of that, it can be trainable using backpropagation and uh, offer us the ability to perform an end-to-end -end training of the main network when the spatial transformer network is injected in. Okay? In our case, the main network will be the facial recognition network. Yeah. Well, and uh, we can say that uh, a spatial transformer network uh, has uh, three components. Uh, a localization network, a grid generator, and a sampler. Uh, the objective of the localization network uh, is to return the parameters theta of the affine transformation that will be applied to the feature map with, where this uh, sp uh, spatial transformer network is injected in. And what is an affine transformation? Well, it's only any kind of transformation that preserves collinearity and that uh, preserves the ratio of distances. Uh, for example, the midpoint of a line segment uh, initially uh, will be the midpoint of that line segment after the transformation. And we can find uh, different types of uh, uh, affine transformations. For example, rotations, uh, translations, uh, scalings, uh, transvections. And uh, the thing is, uh, rotations, uh, scalings, and transvections are linear transformations. And linear transformations can be applied to a point P of coordinate X and Y using the matrix multiplication. But the translation is not a linear transformation because it doesn't leave the origin uh, fixed. And if we want to apply a translation to a point P of coordinate X and Y, we will have to use the uh, sum operator. And in this example, we can see how we have applied a linear transformation given by these four parameters, A, B, D, and E, and uh, to a point P of coordinates X and Y. And this uh, linear transformation uh, could be uh, a rotation or a scaling or a, a transvection. And after that, we have applied a, a translation given by these uh, four parameters, C and F. Okay? And summarizing, uh, we can represent uh, all these uh, uh, affine transformations using uh, six parameters. This is the main important thing of this part. Well, and coming back to the localization network, the input of the localization network will be the input feature map of shape uh, H, W, and C. And the output will be the transformed output of six parameters, the six parameters of the affine transformation. And the architecture that uh, we can use in this place uh, could be a, a multi-layer perceptron or a convolutional neural network uh, ending with a regression layer of six neurons. And here uh, we can see how to code in TensorFlow uh, this uh, localization network uh, using a multi-layer perceptron, in this case of two layers. And uh, we can see that the final layer, the second layer, uh, has uh, six 
neurons. And the bias of this uh, final layer is initialized using the uh, identity matrix. Well, I'm, we are going to see the next component. component. So, well, the grid generator. Well, the job of the grid generator is uh, to return a parameterized sampling grid, which is a set of points, uh, x sub s and uh, y super s in this case, uh, uh, which will be the points where the source input mat uh, should be sampled to perform the desired output uh, matrix. Well, and uh, to obtain that uh, parameterized sampling grid, uh, first the grid generator uh, creates a normalized mesh grid uh, with the same shape as the uh, input feature map. Okay, the input feature map is called U in this case in the in the image. Okay, and uh, after that uh, we are going to in this case we are going to apply some. This, this operation, uh, we are going to take the output of the localization network and we are going to multiply uh, this output of, localiz of the localization network times this normalized uh, mesh grid, which will have uh, values uh, between uh, minus, uh, equally spaced between minus one and one in each axis. And it will have uh, it will be represented using this notation x super t and y super t. And the point is uh, the values of the parameterized sampling grid. Uh, I mean x super s and y super s uh, may be fractional, and because of that uh, we need uh, something more. And this something more is known as sampler. Well, in this case, in this slide, uh, we, we can see how to code this uh, normalized mesh grid, which will, be, which will have uh, equally spaced values between minus one and one in each, uh, in each uh, axis. And here uh, we can see the sampler. Okay. The objective of the sampler is to take the input feature map and the parameterized sampling grid, which will have uh, the coordinates where the input uh, feature map should be sampled to produce the output feature map, to produce uh, uh, the output feature map uh, called B, phi in this case. Okay? And uh, uh, the sampler uh, done that uh, using a, a bilinear interpolation. Okay, uh, the interpolation step is necessary, as I said before, because the values, the output values of the parameterized sampling grid, uh, will be usually fractional, and because of that, uh, uh, these values won't exist in the input feature map, and we need to perform this uh, kernel interpolation. Well, and in this formula, uh, we can see how to compute the output values uh, of the uh, pixel y, which will be in the position x of i super t and y of i super t in the channel c. And uh, the u value will be the input value of the, the input value of the pixel of the feature map at the position nm and in the input channel color t. And next, we are going to apply the interpolation kernel k to the values of the parameterized sampling grid coordinates, where phi sub x and phi sub y will be parameters of the uh, kernel interpolation. As I said before, we usually use uh, bilinear interpolation in this case. Well, and combining these uh, three components, the spatial transformer networks learns how to apply a different uh, transformation on the feature map where it is injected for each input example. This is the main important thing. And the main network, I mean the facial recognition network, uh, learns uh, that uh, some object, uh, for example a face, uh, is the same uh, regardless uh, whether it's rotated or scaled or so on. Okay. Well, um, uh, in this slide, uh, you can see an image of the neural network architecture that we have used to develop the facial recognition model. And you can see what kind of uh, loss function we have tried to minimize in this case, which is known as triplet loss. Uh, the triplet loss is a way to uh, learn good embeddings uh, for each face. Okay. 
And in the embedding space, uh, all the faces of uh, some person uh, should be close together and form well-separated clusters. And the objective of the triplet, of the triplet laws uh, will be to ensure that uh, two examples uh, with the same label uh, have their embeddings close together in the embedding space, and uh, two examples with different labels have uh, their embeddings uh, far away. However, uh, we don't want to push the train embeddings of uh, some label uh, to collapse into very small clusters. The only requirement is that uh, given two positive examples of uh, the same class, or sorry, the same class uh, and one uh, negative example, the negative should be further away than the positive by some margin. And to formalize this uh, uh, requirement, uh, we can say that uh, the triplet laws uh, will work with uh, triplets of embeddings. Well, uh, we have used a ResNet convolutional neural network, and we have cloned uh, this network two times, where the input of the first network uh, will be the anchor, that will be an example of uh, some class, and the input of the second network uh, will be known as positive, which uh, will be a different example of the same class as the anchor, and the input of the third network uh, will be the negative, that uh, will be a different example of a different label than the positive and the anchor. And you can say that uh, in this uh, picture, uh, I have chosen a picture of my face as the anchor, and a different uh, picture of my face as the positive. And I have to apologize for choosing this picture of my partner and friend, Alejandro, <laughs> as the negative. Okay. And uh, uh, here, uh, we can see how to compute the value of the triplet loss, which will be the maximum between zero and the value of that expression. That uh, will be the distance between the embedding of the anchor and the embedding of the positive, plus, uh, minus in this case, uh, the distance between the, the embedding of the anchor and the embedding of the negative, plus some margin. And the most important part uh, here is that uh, as we minimize the triplet loss, the distance between the embedding of the anchor and the embedding of the positive will be closer to zero. And the uh, distance between the embedding of the anchor and the embedding of the negative will be greater than uh, the distance between the embedding of the anchor and the embedding of the positive plus some margin. Well. Perfect. And uh, in this point, we are going to see all this theory working in a robot with, with real data. As I said before, uh, the robot will have a knowledge base in which we are going to have one picture of the face of each person that the robot will have to recognize. And additionally, uh, we are going to train our facial recognition model with a training set uh, composed uh, by approximately uh, 5,000 pictures uh, of uh, each identity. Okay? Well, let's play the video. Dentro. Esta es la grabación de la prueba REFR002, en la que vamos a mostrar el funcionamiento del modelo de reconocimiento de caras empleando como to explain the environment una persona to perform que no está presente en el conjunto de entrenamiento. Lo que se ha hecho es entrenar una red neuronal que genera una función de embedding, de forma que cuando llegue una imagen a esa red neuronal, la función de embedding le asignará un valor. Esa red neuronal ha sido entrenada de forma supervisada mediante tres clases de imágenes. Vamos a ver aquí cuáles son. Tenemos tres carpetas. En la carpeta número 0 hay imágenes mías. En la carpeta número 1 hay imágenes de mi compañero Alejandro. Y en la carpeta base. número 2 okay. hay imágenes de mi compañero Javier. Adicionalmente, el modelo tiene una base de datos en la que colocaremos una única imagen por cada persona que queramos que el modelo reconozca. En nuestro caso tenemos una imagen de Alejandro que está presente en el conjunto de entrenamiento, otra imagen mía que también estoy presente en el conjunto de entrenamiento y por último una imagen de nuestra compañera Rosa que no está en el conjunto de entrenamiento. Entonces vamos a describir la prueba. Lo que vamos a hacer es que nuestra compañera Rosa se va a colocar delante del robot, va a decir 
el comando verbalmente que va a activar el modelo de reconocimiento de caras y a continuación comenzará el robot a tomar imágenes a través de su cámara. Esas imágenes se, vol se volcarán en un topic de ROS y le llegarán al modelo. Por cada imagen que le llegue al modelo, comprobará en primer lugar si hay una cara en dicha imagen y si la hay, se encargará de predecir qué persona se encuentra presente en esa imagen. Y por último, entrará en funcionamiento un modelo de texto speech que reproducirá oralmente el nombre de la persona predicha por el modelo de reconocimiento visual. Muy bien, pues vamos a comenzar con la prueba con nuestra compañera Rosa. Si puedes decirle la palabra, Rosa. Reconoce. Ahora mismo el modelo ya ha aceptado el comando y está empezando a capturar imágenes. En breve dirá el nombre de la predicción. Como hoy se ha podido comprobar, ya ha dicho el nombre de la predicción. Lo ha vuelto a decir, vamos a pararlo para comprobar. ¿De acuerdo? Sí. En este caso, estamos a seguir para que decirlo. Decido que estás hablando, pero no tengo tímpanos. Tengo tímpanos. Es un ejemplo. Aquí vamos ahora a comprobar la salida del modelo. Bueno, pues aquí se ha podido comprobar cómo el modelo ha guardado por cada imagen que ha recibido el nombre de la persona predicha en dicha imagen, que es Rosa. Adicionalmente, lo que hacemos es publicar esa información en un topic de ROS, llamado en este caso peperutils-facename, con el propósito de que otra aplicación pueda hacer uso de esta información. Hasta aquí esta prueba. Ok. This is a, a demo of this facial recognition model with all of its limitations. And I would like to uh, finish the talk by showing that uh, we should move towards uh, models that combine concepts like uh, quantum computing and uh, neuroscience. Um, uh, one example, uh, a first approach based on neurosample, uh, neuroscience uh, could be uh, spiking neural networks. Well, uh, spiking, spiking neural networks uh, work with uh, spikes, which are discrete uh, events that take place at points in time rather than continuous values. Uh, well, and essentially, uh, when a neuron uh, reaches a certain potential, it spikes, and after that, the potential of that neuron will be reset. And at first glance, uh, this may seem like a step backwards, because we have moved from uh, continuous outputs in deep learning models uh, to binary outputs in a spiking neural, in a spiking neural network models. But uh, uh, in the end, uh, uh, the spike trines offer us the ability to process spatio-temporal data, or in other words, uh, real-world uh, sensory data. The spatial aspect uh, refers to the fact that uh, neurons are only connected to neurons local to them. And the temporal aspect uh, refers to the fact that uh, spikes uh, occur over time. And what uh, we are losing with the binary encoding uh, we gain with the temporal information of the spikes, okay? Um, uh, one common model used in uh, spiky neural networks is known as a uh, leaky integrate um, fire model, which is a simple description of a neuron. Well, uh, real neurons have a membrane and have a family of ion channels that control the flow of current across that membrane. Uh, which uh, modulates uh, the action potentials, the membrane action potentials, uh, including the uh, firing of these action potentials. Well, uh, the leaky integrates and uh, uh, fire model uh, implements four features of a real neuron. Well, uh, the entire cell has a single voltage called a V sub M, and it has a membrane with a capacitance called a CSUM, which uh, uh, its units uh, are in uh, farads or uh, columns over volts. And uh, it has a leak channel that allows the current to flow uh, across the, the membrane with a resistance of R sub M, or inversely, with a conductance G uh, equals to 1 over R sub M. Well, and uh, without the application of an uh, external current, uh, the charge carriers traveling across the membrane uh, will be driven uh, by an equilibrium voltage called uh, V sub uh, equilibrium. 
and the action potentials are uh, simulated uh, when the voltage of the neuron uh, reaches a certain value called uh, V sub uh, threshold. And when this neuron spikes, then the voltage of that neuron uh, will be artificially reset uh, to a reset value called uh, V sub R. And uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, you can see a simulation of the structure of, of a neuron. And uh, the equation that describes how the voltage of a neuron changes over time in the face of an externally applied current Y sub M, assuming that tau is equal to the capacitance times uh, the resistance R sub M, is uh, that equation. The derivative of voltage with respect to the time is equal to, uh, that, uh, to that equation. And uh, if, uh, assuming that uh, we have a discrete uh, time step, uh, we could evolve uh, that equation to work with uh, discrete uh, time steps. Okay? And after that, uh, we should define uh, some kind of uh, learning rule, uh, for example, STDP, which is the acronym of uh, spike time independent uh, plasticity. And uh, this learning rule uh, modifies the strength of the synaptic uh, based on uh, the press and post uh, synaptic spikes. And this is only a brief uh, introduction of uh, spiking neural networks uh, with the aim that uh, some of you are attracted to this topic. Um, uh, as the time of uh, my talk has finished, <laughs> uh, I would like to encourage you uh, to keep researching in alternative ways of artificial intelligence to test um, more robust uh, models. Okay. Um, that's all. Uh, you have any questions? Thank you. If you want, we can talk later. I'll be in the data hack booth, okay?